We back at it, episode nine, Patrick Gale show, doing big things. How they show the streets, obviously. They know what we got. We do so special here, Coach. They know, Coach, we do so special. And Coach Gale has a brain like no others. We we using that brain and riding that wave. Coach Gale, man, <laughs> he's right there the man, in the black jacket right there. It's cold in Georgia. It's Coach Patrick Gale. In Georgia. It's cold in Georgia. What's up, Coach? How you doing after Two victories that we had to claim last last show, episode eight, coach. You know what? I'm I'm um I'm very, very uh blessed uh that that I have life, that I can actually see the sun for a little bit. It was raining a little bit. So, you know, thank the Lord for another day. It's raining here in Atlanta, it is 27 degrees. Yeah, it's it's pretty cold. It's about it's about to get colder tonight. So, you know, where we're going this weekend is gonna be really cold. So, you know. Hey, you gotta love winters. January. Yes. You know what, coach? This January, we this is why we know that global warming is real and maybe that revelations <laughs> is telling us something because you get getting tornadoes one week, storm ice the next <laughs> That's week. true. Because the revelations did say that you wanna know that this when the seasons when it's when it's time to go back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's so true, man. That's why that's why you gotta stay close to the Lord because you don't know what's gonna happen. And and um, if you're not close to the Lord, you you you're gonna be scared and in fear. But those who are, you know, we just observe, we watch, and we're we're ready for it. No doubt, coach. Observe and watch the law. We know that's going on already. <laughs> <laughs> gotta keep all eyes open. <laughs> Hey, hey, there's a lot of watching going on, and you're either you're either being watched or you're watching someone else. But there's a lot of watching going on. Yeah, right. I was shot, coach. I really was. Hey, Jr. You 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 said the show is the hottest thing on the streets. Nah, you the hottest thing on the streets, man. I'm just I'm just happy to be in your graces, man. You the hottest thing on the streets. Hey, man, it's hilarious, man. And Coach, I know you had a great win this weekend, but I know things didn't make you as happy as one to make you. But the fact that you get your young man post degree got the job, and despite those things, so you can learn from with a win. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know what? I have to give, you know, a lot of the credit to my assistant, uh, Coach White. I don't think, you know, um, as people are watching the uh, NFL playoffs right now and – People are talking about coaches being fired and this coach going there. What you guys don't understand is that the staffs that are connected to the coaches don't know what's going on either. And they're, they work hard as much as a head coach works hard. The assistant coaches, if you're a good one, works harder than the head coach. And Coach White works tireless, uh, tirelessly, you know, preparing our guys. And it's very disappointing you know, when when we we work so hard and we have to in the game even work harder, uh 49 turnovers in two games is unacceptable. Um I think we had 18 missed free throws last night. We missed a ton of free throws on Saturday, and they're both home games. That's unacceptable. So I have to give a lot of credit to my assistant coach White. Um uh, and and definitely give credit to the guys because they're on the court, you know, working physically, but mental fatigue. And you can see it on a lot of coaches, you know, at the professional level in the NFL. Mental fatigue is is a lot more straining than phys physical fatigue. So we hope that our guys can get a little bit uh, more uh, mental toughness and more emotional intelligence to finish games out. And free throws is just about, you know, mental toughness. So we have to do better. And turnovers, mental toughness. Now, not with that said, Ella Waters and Savannah State play absolutely great defense. So I'm not taking any credit away from them. Um, and I did say that Ella Waters would first force a lot of turnovers, and they did. They actually forced more than their average. And Savannah State, uh, Coach Brodnax does a great job. It's always a defensive struggle to play against him. But we have to do better taking care of the ball and, and putting the ball in the basket from the free throw line. No doubt, because those are the, those points that catch up with you, especially like for me, Coach Gill, a one and one free to miss is like this is two free throws to me. That's right. Or I look at it, turnover or missing two free throws. How do you look at it? I look at they look at it that way. Miss opportunities, and especially 
games become more important because that's SIAC East is uh hard. <laughs> Every <laughs> JR, how would you know about that? Do you have any uh personal <laughs> witness to how hard the East is? <laughs> I think I'll do it more ways than one, coach. <laughs> No, that's SIAC East. All the coaches have said the same thing that I talked to. It's a gauntlet. Um, and I'm gonna put it in in we we prophesize on this show. The SIAC is gonna have three teams in the NCAA uh, regional tournament, and and they're gonna be three deserving teams, you know. So it is a gauntlet to play on the East. Every game, every possession is gonna be so much. Uh, greater, you know, as we go forward to the end of the season. So we have to take care of business on the free throw line and take care of the ball. And, you know, coach, you guys have to really just say, hey, look, I'm after practice, I got to shoot a 100, 200 free throws because I'm tired anyway. You so, know what's funny? You know what's funny, JR? We, you know, one of my old players said, hey, coach, you still make them run for missed free throws? We do all of that. It comes down to mental toughness. And I guess the best analogy would be if you're in a class, the professor says you start out with an A, you have to do your studying. So you can study at home, you can pay attention in class, but when the test date comes and you're not mentally focused and prepared, when you've already seen these questions and you've already had, if you're doing math, you've already practiced these problems, if you're not mentally ready to answer those questions, then you have to look at your preparation internally. You can't look at the class and the professor. You can't look at your study group. You have to look at what you're doing different. So when you're on that free throw line, you have to practice that same routine, whether you're in the game, whether you're tired, you know, whether you're in practice, whether you're by yourself in the gym. At this time of year, I tell my guys, when you guys, and they're in the gym, when you work out, the best thing you could do is shoot. You know, all the other stuff that, you know, you see that people are doing at this time of year in conference, you got to be in routine. You have to be in rhythm, you know. So to me, that's all mental. It's all mental. And Coach, you're talking to a at least a 12, 13-time basketball champ free throw shooter right here. <laughs> Is that right, JL? <laughs> yes. So I was what's always your routine on the line, JL? What's your routine? It's the... It's not like my jump shot. I play. I get on the nail, kind of slant it slant to, slant to the left, and I do this little route so I'm shooting back in. Okay. It, so like, if you stand straight down the nail, you if you tired, it's gonna go off. But Good point. for me, if I'm slanting to the, my feet slant to the left on the nail, coming back with this little kind of, it's gonna go in because I'm giving it that angle goes to the right. I got some margin for error. Really? Right. And now me personally, I didn't get off the line between first and second section. I didn't get off the line because yeah, like you can't. Yeah. Because yeah. I knew my stance and you can talk all the crap you want to. I know what I'm doing. Right. And I typically shot it between 89 and 91 at the free throw line because my routine is like I knew what I was for a reason I decided to slant and come back with so I can angle the back to the right, have mm -hmm. arch barrel. If you're right. down the middle on the nail, you off, you off. Mm -hmm. So I try, I try to slant it so I give myself shooting towards the right some, some opportunity. Mm -hmm. If I was tired, if I was a little bit off, I had a chance still. To, and most time it worked. Well, my my former player, um, he actually played overseas a little bit. Actually, big up, big up, Tim Sada, my <laughs> former player from, from uh, St. Thomas University. This is where he played. But um, he shot 90% his senior year, and he played like 35 minutes a game. Um, I believe he led us in scoring. And, you know, he would be in the gym by himself shooting free throws, and he always said, Coach, I've got to remember to trust my legs. So to me, it starts with your base. Mm -hmm. And I tell my guys all the time, you have to shoot the same shot. You have to have the same uh, routine. Obviously, your elbow and your follow-through is everything, but it starts with your base. You have to trust your base, trust your legs. And I think, again, that's mental. To me, it has to be a free throws is more about how it feels more than logic. 
if I feel the same way every time, the shot's going to come off the same time. And it, you know what it goes back into? It goes back into physics. So if you can make it feel the same, that means your body's giving the same force. And like you said, give the same arc and the same angle. But it, it, it has to be something that has to be broken down mentally. Yeah, you have to find what works for you. But I'll try to tell guys, I will get off and off the nail. That, that, that's my because yeah. straight down the, on the nail, you try to shoot the ball straight. And when you, your legs are gone or you don't have a habit, it's going to show. You don't need to shoot it short alone. But with my right. shot, I had enough arc on it. I've been in my knees and coming back with it. So, like, I knew what a – and it took me about 11 years old to figure it out. <laughs> well – that's that's the job of the coach to to continue to push and to continue to to work these guys and you can't simulate game situations and I get and that's why I said it's definitely mental and it's definitely something that they're gonna have to do internally but we better fix it that's all I know you know what coach you know when I was a young a young a young man you know it once went to Hawks player that got my attention you know I like Charles Oakley. Charles Smith, the Hawks grant, shooting those jumpers. And so my dad would feed me the ball and have me shoot those jumpers like Oakley. And they, they would take those kind of those around the, the around the, you know, the right blood three point line, right around the elbows, get those little jumpers and they would get open. You know, when you're getting double teamed or whoever's getting double teamed, kick it out the Hawks grant with his magic or the, or the Bulls and shoot that little jumper right there, boom, and knock it down. So my dad, my fish and go, or go to the real gyms, the YMCA. You know, feed me the ball and do what I do. So it was like, so my dad drilled me on these things. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, again, yeah, well, we know we know how great your dad is, man. It's all about discipline and it's all about keeping that routine and finding what works for you, number one, and then staying with it every day. And you know, he, he also had me work on, you know, that pump fake drive. So he said, when they go start closing out. Best thing in basketball. That's right. The best thing in basketball is the shot fake. That's the number one thing in basketball. If you should, if you make one, they're gonna come flying at you on the next one. So that's the best thing in basketball. Now the thing he didn't teach me was how to draw fouls. I, he said, "No, you just drive the bag. You don't. I don't want you to do all that stupid drawing the foul garbage. It's like somebody else I know does. But I'm not gonna say that." <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, you know, you can't you can't rely on the whistle because the whistle's not going to be the same. That you can't control, but you yeah, can control. So, so he was always like, "Hey, you try that ball and then get worried about the whistle at, at the basket." <laughs> you know, so right, that's right. You can control everything else, but you can't control the whistle. You know, and coach with this pace base game, like you, I remember we used to run double screens off the baseline to get a little little mid range jumper on the baseline. Now, it's, hey, we running double and triple screens to get threes now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the game, the games expanded a little bit, and and uh, you can thank Steph Curry for changing the game. Um, and he's also another great free throw shooter. And if you watch him, he has a routine uh, before and after his free throw goes in, and it's all mental. I could tell. You know, Ray Allen is another one. You they and he had, he made a great commercial about, you know, he basically gave the blueprint of how to shoot free throws and how to kind of block everything out and be mentally just locked in with the rim. So, you know, the game has changed, the game has expanded out, it's helped guys that are a little bit smaller to to be effective, which is awesome. But, you know, then you have guys like Victor Rembignana, that's the, the longest you've ever seen play, you know, on the perimeter. And he's just as skilled as a guard. So the game's in a great place right now. And dude had 20 and 10 in the second, the second half. It's talent. And this is his rookie year. Wait till he really figures it out in three or four years. He's he's going to be really dominant. But it's, it's exciting to see. And there's going to be more guys behind him, you know, that that are going to be very good. And now he's going to affect, you know, 11 and 12 year olds currently in, you know, eight or nine years. Look at what they're going to be. So I'm excited for the game. And coaches made me laugh. Think about it. You know, my dad would call five. Five was like eight. The weak, the weak side corner guy runs on the baseline for a double screen and get that mid-range jump right there on the baseline. He was, he went in the best, he'd call five. Five. And he would say his little something else. I was a busy saying, but we didn't play. <laughs> but, but that's great that you remember your play calls, man. That 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 mean that means you had a great coach and that means you were a great learner. And four down was to get a down screen for the four man to get an elbow jump. But so I remember all those different plays. So your dad, your dad loved the mid-range game. 
but back then is all we had. Remember, it ain't quite basically a three point line yet. So yeah, yeah. Well, I I feel like the mid range game still needs to be around. To me, that that actually gets you your rhythm. You know, if you're the, the, the Kevin Durant, I think it shoot like near fifty percent. Mm-hmm. You know, from the three point line. But he still, you know, gets to his mid range game. I mean, these are just excellent shooters that, you know, and and they're so skilled, they're so long. I mean, like I said, they, the, what I love is that they have put so many seeds out there globally in teaching young people how to play. And it starts with dribble, passing, and shooting. As great of a shooter as Steph Curry and Kevin Durant are, even when Bignana, they're great passers, they're great ball handlers. Yeah, you know, my dad loved the Rose and loves uh he loves yep. my he loves my man, you know, dude. Man, look, he loves all the mid-range dude. Like he loves DeAndre Hunter for that. He loves yep. Jante yep. Murray for that who needs love. And Jante, I love you, brother. It's not, it's not your fault. But while in it, because the same thing. And even Paul George to a degree does it as well. Yeah. So he loves getting that because he feels like you can get you can get on Three point line, they can kind of close out to you. Just, you know, attack you. Mid range, they got to kind of okay. I can't come out too far. I got to kind of defend the drive. So you put them in conflict. My dad's thing was put people in conflict. Well, I, I have to shout out my guy in, in New York right now, Jalen Brunson. But shout out more so Jay Wright and the staff that he had that he played for uh, in Villanova because they did a great job of teaching guards the pivot teaching guards how to not only play mid-range, but how to play in the post and how to use your pivot and how to use your rip through and how to use your triple threat. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm from, you know, a place where Hubie Brown, uh, Rick Pitino, uh, those guys, uh, Pat Riley, those guys taught not just the offensive game, but the defensive game. And I see guys like Jay Wright, um, Tubby Smith, um, Kelvin Sampson, you know, guys that not only teach the fundamentals of the game, but also teach the defensive fundamentals, you know, how to how to play with angles, how to use space to keep the ball in front, moving your feet, you know, chesting up, walling up. I mean, kudos to those guys and what they've done for the game. No doubt. You know what, Coach? I'm one of the Browns camps in Atlanta. When he, 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 he wasn't going to anymore, but he still had camps in Atlanta. He still lived in the reaction. Listen, Hubie Brown, I, I remember growing up in New York and listening on the radio um, and, and listening to Hubie Brown um, and, and listening to Nick Games and being excited to watch him on CBS and, and just learn and just be a sponge with everything that he said, you know, uh, and how to play. And, and it was almost like if you grew up in New York back in the 80s, and in nineties and and um, late seventies, it was almost like Hubie Brown was speaking to you personally, because he's such a great teacher. And like you talked about his camps, I wasn't blessed enough to go to his camps, but I I definitely learned just by watching and listening on the radio and going out in the playground. And you know, I we used to play uh, right there in our driveway uh, in New York and Brooklyn. And we we would here's a crazy thing: some people use crates. Growing up, I would use like the brick outline and just shoot off the brick and just dribble in the street and dribble, you know, on the on the sidewalk. That's why so many New York guys can handle because everywhere we we had a ball, we would dribble. We would dribble in the house. We would dribble on the sidewalk. We would dribble everywhere we went. But you know, going to the playground, all we did was practice what Hubie Brown taught us. So, man, I, I love Hubie Brown. I've never met him, um, but to me, that's my my number one all time favorite coach. I love Hubie Brown. It's funny we see me say he was one of my campers. I'm so proud of this young man. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Hubie Brown and this guy right here, the 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 all time legend. Uh, John I saw Thompson. his son on. I saw his son Saturday when, when, when the Wizards were in town. John Thompson That's awesome. those, those two guys. I grew up on those two guys. If you wanted to play for John Thompson, man, I loved uh, John Thompson and Georgetown, man, and 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 you could speak to any coach. Uh, John Thompson, uh, for me, Hubie Brown, being from New York, those two guys were, were – you can't say anything about those two coaches. Those, that's how I learned the game. No doubt. I think that is coach. I, I've been to the camps of the czar, Mike Patello, who's coach of the Hawks, Lenny Wilkins. Patello, yep. 
Dale so Lenny Wilkins. Yep. I've been blessed to be around some good coaches in their camp. So in this, you know, no, no, it was like being from Atlanta. It's like, man, look, it was the best thing to do for me. You know, going to these camps, learning to these guys, and you know, bringing back to my dad what I learned, and you know, yeah. and he put his own twist on it. You know, <laughs> so, and, and you know what's funny? So many coaches that are coaching now started just like you. Um, you know, the, these camps are so important and, you know, guys like that, that give their time and really teach, you know, and really engage. I mean, I tell, when we do our camp, we do a prospect camp, you know, every October and then we also do it in May. And that's a big thing for my guys. That's, I, I, that's like a team bonding thing. Where, you know, our guys volunteer for it. And I tell these guys that these kids, they need your teaching. They want to be where you are. They can't touch and talk to the NBA players or the big power five guys, but they can talk to you that are still college athletes and, and college basketball at any level is big time. I tell my guys that all the time. So you have a responsibility to make sure these young people are learning the fundamentals of the game and learning what it takes to get there. And coach, I'll tell you this another story about camp. Going to Tennessee State's basketball camp, with Frankie Allen, who's the coach there and meeting Carlos Rogers, Monty Wilson and Anthony Mason, that pretty much made me want to win a tie for me to, I already know how it was, how those guys treated me as a little little kid. Yeah. I yeah. got to be around three and three. three. My, my, my mind was played overseas, lives in Atlanta now. But Carlos Rogers and Anthony Mason, you know, it's playing the NBA. That's I right. Them as a, That's as right. a child, and they treated me, they treated me nice. That's right. That's right. God bless. God bless Mace. You know, you couldn't be couldn't be a Knicks fan in the 90s and and not, you know, know and love Anthony Mason and Carlos Rogers. You know, his story is so awesome, too, man. But it's, it's cool that we're we're bringing up these guys, man. I mean, they they're heroes to guys like us, man, because, you know, I, I love the underdog. I love the guy that, you know, made his name from not anybody helping him he did it you know and and you know that 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 just shows that you can make it from anywhere and anything and you don't have to be um a player you can make it as an executive you can make it as a coach right now analytics is a big thing in the league and there's so many guys that have jobs you know in in all professional leagues that were really good students and had a love for math had a love for sports and it's awesome that you can tie both in. And I will say this, as someone that has taught in the inner cities, you have a lot of people in the inner cities that love academics, that love math, that get up and go to school every day to learn. And I pray for those young people that get that path to, to get the jobs that they're seeking because not everybody in the hood wants to be a basketball player. You got some people that want to be astronauts, that want to be scientists, that want to be uh, data analytical people. So we have to give those people, you know, their shine and their due as well. There's a lot of smart kids that are in really tough situations, really tough schools, and they have to go through war zones to get to school. And they want to study and they want to, you know, learn math and learn science and change the world. They see the world differently. So kudos to them. I've taught a lot of students like that. You would you would cry with some of the stories, but you also look at them like, yeah, you're going to be somebody special. And I don't want to just promote athletes. I want to promote all our people, all our young people. No doubt, Coach. And I want to say this one more thing about my father, Coach. You like this. My father still charts games on legal pads. Wow. That's awesome. He goes, your, father, your father's a math guy, is what you're trying to say, JR. He charts the games. He still draws up stuff. And it, and his head to, he's in his eighth decade. He still already plays and drawing up stuff and showing it to me, asking me, what are you seeing? Are you seeing this too? Like when I watch a game, my father, like I'm getting quizzed still. So Jr. Where, where again? What was your father's ethnicity and nationality, Jr. Again, remind remind the people, Jr. The mother, my, that's my mother, but my, my dad's Canadian and, and, Bar, and Barbadian. So, but hold up, say that one more time. Canadian and Barbadian. Okay, so people from Jamaica and people from Ghana, we we believe that we're brothers because we know our history yeah. and our lineage. So yeah. what you mean? I know your mom's Jamaican. I know your father is Ghanaian and and you said he's Bayesian. He's from Barbados as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, Barbados, yes, yes. All the same people. 
I yes. just wanted to point that out to the people. All yeah, the oh, yeah, of course. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, he definitely still does that, man. So I can watch the game with my father on to get ready. I got to have my thinking hat on this. Be <laughs> watching it from a but that, perspective. That's the theme of the show, though. We we I started out with it being mental. That's the thing. You have to you have to in, 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 you have to get math and science involved in sports. And you know, as someone that you can tell, I've taught middle school math, so I've had to fight this for a long time. But I'm trying to get kids to understand. You know, when you watch ESPN and you see, you know a receiver that scores a touchdown and they show you how his, his miles per hour, they show you the arc of the football being thrown. They show you now when you watch a basketball game, when, a, when, a, when there's a shot being taken, you know, how deep the shot is, you know, those things, that's all math. And somebody has to do that. And you'd be surprised how much people get paid to do that and to put that on a graphic. So for any young people watching, you don't just have to be, a big time player to take care of your family and get out of your situation. You can use math and science to do that. No doubt, folks. See, as I tell people all the time, coach, we don't plan this. This just happened. This is just organic. Well, you know, at the end of the day, if, if they feel it is scripted, all I can say is, you know, kudos to to the to the Lord and the Creator because honestly, right before you you we got on, I was watching film and I was pissed with all the turnovers, <laughs> and you know, I just had to calm myself down, and you know, I just go in a different mode. So right now, I guess I'm in teacher mode right now. Yeah, yeah. So I love it, Coach. The Lord he puts the, the Lord has put it all, all in us already. It just systematically, symbolically happens without a script <laughs> or cue cards. I, I, I don't. I, I I will have to say I don't have time to script anything. Half the time I forget to eat during the day, so I don't have time to script anything. Yeah, I, I I got too much work to do. I've got too many responsibilities, and I've got too many sleepless nights about being in this gauntlet in the SIAC, especially on the east side right now. So ain't nothing scripted. No doubt. Well, folks, episode nine, got your girl show in the books next week. Episode 10, a milestone, 10th episode. Hopefully, I'm going to go down to a in the unknown place today. I see if we get a guest for episode 10. And if not, they are there. They, 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 they know who they are and they, they know why. But I'm going to try for such, such a show, Coach, episode 10, man. <laughs> they are. I will say this, though. I need to have your dad on the show, man. We want, we want Mr. Uh, boss man, senior on the show. <laughs> yeah, the big boss man. See, he was the big boss man. So I got dubbed Jr. because he's the because we have the same exact name. But you know, it's like yeah. So he's yeah. So I got it from him. He's get him on the show. Get him on the show, Jr. If I gotta call him personally, get him on the show, man. Get him on the show. I will tell, I will tell him, him today and see if he's willing to do that. <laughs> and tell and tell him it'll be me just shutting up. And just listening to him, you know, I'm big on listening to the elders speak, man. He's got a lot of history within him, so he would be so interesting to have. No, Deco, I will ask him today when I speak with him to see what he says. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, folks, Coach, get on now. We love this show. We'll keep going on. Episode 10 is up next, so we go and hope you enjoy episode 9. Great show. We'll see you next week. Got your girl, Shelly.